Well, in the group we have uh, a Serbian person, a Serbian woman, a Norwegian woman, an American woman. All men, as I said, um, all Northern Irish, all, all white, um, all probably from sort of, sort of professional type, type, type classes. A woman from Mallorca, uh, I'm from Barcelona. We have two British people, but who didn't come from London originally. So not especially diverse. But the interesting thing is, even in that sort of uh, group, the, 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 the views are, 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 quite, are, are quite different. That's one of the interesting things about um, going to a, a book club is that, you know, you, you read the book very carefully and then you find that other people have seen things that you haven't, haven't seen or different perspectives. So we're, we're quite, we're quite a, a diverse group in, 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 in terms of opinions. I decided not to look up the authors and I decided not to read the introductions before I looked at the pictures mm -hmm. because I wanted to make up my own mind. And what I found about this one was what amazed me was the freshness. Although they are pictures of the 50s, they are so fresh and immediate and they could have been taken a few days ago. I mean, some things dated like mm. the cars and the suits, mm. but the people's expressions, they are like people that exist <laughs> today. Mm -hmm. You know, movie premiere, the Hollywood star, the starlet, she's always the focus of every single photograph. However, that's not what interested him. He's focusing on the fans, you know, the adoring one, the <laughs> jealous, envious one, the anxious one, oh, could I be like... But I just love the way he's focusing on the people who never get any attention and he captures their inner lives so well in just you know, the click of the shutter. I think that's amazing. I don't know if he decided to put the book together like this, or was his editor, but the layout I think is amazing. You have this very wealthy couple here, charity ball in New York City, and you turn the page, <laughs> this poor guy here in his cafeteria in San Francisco, kind of like shoving yeah. a meal down in between yeah. shifts. Um, and yeah, he isn't passing any judgment on one or the other, but you just flick from one to the other and say, yep, this is all in the same country, it's all at the same time, these people live there, these people mm. live there, you know, their lives will possibly never meet. Well, what the book does render is this sort of collapse between what used to be very private interior spaces and what is now becoming more public. So why are these teens out having a good time and, and, and uh, you know, kissing in, in the parks and so on? Well, they have cars now that can take them there. There's, there is a sense that we're at the cusp of uh, something that is, in terms of sexual mores, a kind of liberatory, you know, there, there's some kind of a freedom there going on. I guess America for Europeans has always been seen as a place where spectacle, where the public space, the park, uh, the convention center, he takes for, you know, the street is a place where loads of stuff goes on. You know, it's just, it's exciting because there's so much going on outside and everybody can look at it. And this, okay, so despite the cars, which are mm -hmm. old, they're all half naked. Mm -hmm. And you think, wow, you know, it's very free and modern and... They're like, making out. Yeah, they? they're just... I love it. There they are. And mm. but it's just the cars that make you think, you know, or you know that it's a while ago. Um, but yeah, and they're just right next to each other too. It's like, they're just desperate. <laughs> the other thing is, of course, that the 1950s is the generation of the teenager, it really is. It's the first time where teenagers as a demographic become a consumer market. You know, up until the Second World War, young people were meant to be children, obviously, and then become mini adults, go into the workforce, dress sensibly, have babies, do what their parents did. Suddenly you have in the 50s places that are marketed for teenagers, the diner, the outdoor cinema is a big thing for young people. 
I can imagine for Frank, as a, uh, you know, a Swiss citizen, that would have been really a new thing. He would have been quite mesmerized by that. Anyway, what, what about the Americans? I thought I thought it was the most, yes. the most interesting of the three. What did you like? Which ones? I I liked a, a number of them. If I can find find them again. I did like the Steady Fathers, you know, yeah. oh, just yeah, because right. it was amusing. But that guy at the end, I, I don't know what he's doing. I, it's like as if he was um, having a little fantasy about kissing somebody. Uh, the, 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 the photograph before it is uh, of the same uh, parade, you know. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's um, and the, there's no women on the platform, but the women are hiding behind uh, the, the, the windows. The windows and the flag. That's, that's where Sinatra grew up. Frank Sinatra grew up, and his mum was one of the big movers and shakers politically. As right. well, so it's it's quite tell you know that just ah. coincidental, but she was a big player in terms of galvanizing people politically. So a lot of women yeah. were you know amongst the Italian and American communities. No, were really active in in in, uh, in politics. Yes. Yeah. The the first edition that came out in France, which is impossible to get a hold of now, the French publisher, and that's very telling, saw the book as. Uh, much more sociologically sort of critical and almost as a piece of sort of anthropological criticism and um, or an ethnography of, of what was wrong with America. So that edition had quotes from different sort of uh, ethnographers, sociologists, writers and those quotes became sort of captions for the photographs that were much more critical. So I've always wanted to get a copy of that to see how that type of material would make me look at the photographs, but I'm also a bit worried about doing it because I quite like my romantic version of the book. The Americans I loved, and I'm going to say that it's like an anthropological portrait uh, by gender, by race, by class, by activities. Um, and almost none looks at the eyes. They are all looking away because it's these snapshots of... And I found that very interesting. It's very rare that they are looking at you, except for the bus in New Orleans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But most people uh, don't realize they're being photographed. Yeah, yeah That's I know. So Which nowadays maybe wouldn't be so allowed, by the way. What, Brit yeah. what British photo uh, photographers were about at that time? Bailey, who else? I have no idea. I have what no about interest the in one? photography at all. What? I have no interest. I don't know any photographers. But it's, all, it's all around you. How, how could you not be? I mean, it's the, it's the currency of our time, isn't it? If, if you haven't got an imagery, uh, if you're not fed by imagery, you, you're living an impoverished life nowadays. Presumably, how, how can that yeah. be, really how can that be special? That is an American girl. She couldn't be anything else, isn't she? Well, well there's, there, 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 are, there are two women with almost the same, same, same clothes. Yes, yes. But she, she couldn't be a, a uniform. With she could. That could be today, that could be a Yugoslav, it could be a French girl, it could be anything. And it could be taken anywhere. Yes. But it, it, what, what is so amazing? What is, why, why, why do you think that made the plate? You have a still photograph and she's real. She exists. She, she, she doesn't have to be a person in the next room. She, her soul is in that photograph. Bang. Mm. I actually enjoyed them, sort of like looking at them second time round, um, having looked at the other ones, uh, having yearned at the beginning for why more, why more people and something slightly more, you know, emotional. How much more credence would you give if we ha were handed a box of photographs that weren't in a book? And I said some of these photographs are taken by photographers and some are just been taken by Joe Bloody Blogs. Absolutely. You want, in some instances, I don't think we could tell 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 a difference. It's just like well, there you go. Testing testing wine without the labels are you know, can be very get it very wrong. Yes, it would be per perfectly possible to show this book um, to people and then, and then think I can do that, and probably they can. And this is an interesting uh, sort of democratic principle in photography that. Um, we know that someone can go out into the street and make something quite quickly and it can be extraordinary. Um, and photography is full of accidental masterpieces. Um, the way that oil painting or symphonic composition is not. Um, can you do a whole book of them? That's another, <laughs> that's another matter. Um, I think 
um, if you show a book of the work of someone like Cartier-Bresson to people uh, who maybe don't know much about photography, I think they probably will be able to appreciate something quite quickly, the interlocking dance of shapes. But I also think the fact that uh, Cartier-Bresson is sort of stopping time, that, that the shutter is very active, you know, the decisive moment in the way that it's not in Stephen Shaw's pictures. You know, time, time appears to stretch out. He never really stops anything with the camera. He's, he's photographing things that are pretty much still anyway. His photographs are not sort of ecstatic in the way that a street photograph can be with, you know, frozen action. Your gaze is um, extending over time when you're looking at the picture and you don't really know what the photograph's relation to that time is, the time of that scene, because nothing is being stopped. So yeah, generally pictures that are not shutter pictures, if I can put it that way, um, people have a harder time uh, appreciating them. It takes a little longer for people to get their eye in and, and figure out a way of relating to them. Two minutes later I then turned to Stephen Shore and I thought okay what's going to happen we've got mm. this bleak yeah. landscape and I thought oh not another one <laughs> and also it's a very it's a very different format because it's so big yeah. and so heavy and it's not something that you would just pick up whereas the Americans I had found myself sort of while I was waiting for something to happen, I just sort of picked up and continued. This you have to sit to look at. But then when I opened it, I realized, you know, at the very beginning, you've got, da, 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 da. ooh, we're not just looking at landscapes, we're looking at other things. And I thought maybe this is going to be interesting after all. And, and this book made me very happy. Light, I really felt in the end that I was just being beamed at by, by a, an ultraviolet, you know, one of those lights of the, of the yeah, 70s, well, like actually. Sun lamp. Mm. Sun lamp, yeah. exactly. Sun lamps. It was really glowing at me. And, and despite the fact that I did, wouldn't want to have been in any of these places, I was happy at the end of looking at it. And the, the pictures of the people that you have, they look, they looked, I could see why he had taken pictures of these people. I wanted to look at them as well. It was really quite astounding. I didn't, I didn't take the time to read his interview at the back. But I do understand that a lot of thought went into his composition and he was calculating and if I step back then this relationship to this will change. And I could really see that there was a reason why he had stood at this particular point to take a picture at that point. And it really achieved something with me. Um, Shaw is uh, very, very acutely aware of what the edge of a picture does because the edge of a photograph is not the same as an edge of a painting. You know when you look at a photograph that that relates to a cutting out of the world. So where, so where a cut falls is very, very important if you're a picture maker. Sometimes his pictures are composed from the outside in, it seems to me, where he's thinking about the edges and the middle takes care of itself. That's how my mother taught me to butter toast. Take care of the edges and the middle will take care of itself. And some pictures work like that. Others, he'll just have something very interesting in the centre of the frame, which relates much more to the, to the amateur snapshot or the supposedly you know, uncomposed picture where you just point at the thing in the middle. Shaw knows that all of these different ways of working could be compelling. Um, and you don't want one type of picture only in your book. Well, I, I'm going to start with one that I least enjoyed, which, which was this one. I like this. I calculated this one calculator in the window, and I thought it was quite funny. This one, I like this Shamar beauty salon, and it just made me think of, um, I don't know, just the, the era and the language, and I mean, it just looks hideous. Composition-wise, I'm sure they're very beautiful, and you know, I appreciate the sort of different perspectives and the colours. I found them just overall quite dull and so I was trying to identify things that make me smile a bit more. 
I thought that was a really contemporary scene, but for these cars, I this I thought was fab. Well, the color of the stoplights yeah. uh, and the, the cars, the, the fire hydrants. Yeah, you've got um, like the, the red, the green, the blue, the, the yellow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this car here, you could see this on a London street, actually, a vintage car. But it's just a, I thought that was quite a fab picture. It's fascinating that there's there's never a correct way to read a photograph, and in many ways, the more the more generous the, the photographic observation of the world, you know, the less, the less of themselves a photographer puts into it. Uh, the more neutral the picture is, actually, the, the more disarming it can be to look at, because you don't know quite what you're looking for, or whether you're supposed to be making a judgment, or whether you're supposed to be looking for information in a picture. Stephen Shaw was due to come here um, to my library to record a a long conversation which was eventually published in a retrospective book and uh, before he came my brother-in-law was uh, sitting with me and he opened Uncommon Places and he looked through it and he doesn't have a background in photography um, although he's as interested as anyone in, in looking at photographs and he went very slowly through the book and uh, he got to the end and he said um, there's a lot of MGB cars in this book which took me by surprise, and he said, uh, "Yeah, what do you think that means? Do you think that means there was a lot of there were a lot of MGB cars in America in the seventies, or uh, did he like them?" I said, "Well, he's coming in a couple of hours. You can ask him." So we got to the end of lunch, and uh, he plucked up the courage and he said, "So, Stephen, I've been looking at your book, Uncommon Places, which was the bigger volume actually, this one," and uh, he said, um, "I've noticed there are a lot of MGBs." Well, Stephen Shaw's eyes lit up and he said, it's interesting you notice that. Um, he said, yeah, was there, were, were there a lot of MGBs in America or were you just interested in them? And he said, well, my wife, Ginger, was crazy about MGBs. And she had a couple during the 70s and they're in the pictures, uh, but there are other MGBs too. And I think I was somehow predisposed towards them. Well, look, that's a... That's a perfectly legitimate reading of a photograph. That's, that doesn't come out of left field, that comes out of the picture. Um, that's as significant a way of responding to those pictures as any other. You know, I, the general impression, if I was an alien arriving and this was the only evidence that I had of a place called America, I would think it was populated by lizards, you know? I, I, I would think it was populated by cars. <laughs> they're everywhere, they're everywhere. He, he's actually got the 70s absolutely nailed. There's no question. The, the, yeah. That portrait there on 165, the guy sitting by the pool and the concrete with... I remember being in Fort Lauderdale, I was there in 70 in Miami, same time, 73, and that just reminds me of how... Yeah. I mean, at the time we thought it was great because we were sort of university. But looking at that now, I see myself lying back there, and he's got his boots, his boots, and I have to. Did he actually walk down to that swimming pool and take his boots off? Yeah. And, and then he was photographed. Yeah, yeah. But it's it, that that is it nailed, you know. Yeah. This is an aspect I think that uh, I think we everybody has in relation to photographs, um, but so-called serious criticism has a hard time with the idea of somebody wanting to project themselves into the space of you know imagining what it's like to be there it's true many of the photographs feel like um, the f the first thing you might see after a long drive and you arrived at your aunt mary street and you stood there quite tired and sort of surveyed it and you just looked down the street something like that that's a that's a particular kind of vision and it's probably quite a heightened vision even if you're tired and Shaw has talked about this that you know when you're driving along and he did a lot of driving you're in a sort of trance then you stop the car you're at a different tempo you feel the ground under your feet you feel the temperature of the air the humidity of the air in a way that you don't in a sort of air-conditioned car and all of this makes you sort of super alert and 
if you're clever and skilled at it, you might be able to translate something of that into a picture. Um, and that might mean that part of the experience of the picture is not just contemplating it as an exemplary rectangle, but imagining that you're in it. Uh, now, regarding these three books, uh, two of them are very banal, quite ordinary photographs of American life through certain periods of time, uh, not even really coffee table books, uh, nothing extraordinary about them whatsoever uh, that I could see. And then we came to the third book, which was given to us, I think wrongly so, very ordinary, sort of dark, grimy photographs, which really had no merit whatsoever. So the whole idea of the three books I feel the third one was here to shock. It certainly didn't shock me. Um, certainly would never let anybody uh, look at it because mm -hmm. it's uninteresting. It's not, around the coffee table. It, it's, not, it's not pornographic. It's not mm -hmm. uh, it nice cool. pornographic stuff that you'd see that you would see in the sun every day of the week. You know, this is grim, ordinary, unattractive photographs. Actually, the three books, in my opinion, are all unattractive, right? And really, there's not much more I could say about them but that. I, I must admit, it, it's, uh, and I actually did take a little bit of time to read the, the preface, and it, it, it's referred to as, uh, in her terms, she, she, she says that the photographs are an open book, they're kind of an open diary, and she represents it as an invitation to my world, is the, is the phrase. And I gotta say, I, I'll decline on the invitation. I. I I, and I, the images are, are far from pornographic. They are gritty, grimy, steeped in reality, steeped in all the detritus. And I did not care one iota for her world or what she was inviting me to look at. Um, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't for a moment argue with the fact that there's candor and, and, and probably honesty in it, but not... Not for me. I mean, I, she I, tells a story. Oh, she's she's telling a story of yeah. of, of a social context and her tribe, and I'm just very no, grateful. Even beyond I that, uh, yeah. I know. The no, no, I, I say I, I flick through it. They, and, well, and, and, and it's, there's again, a photograph I, and of the just, parents. No, but it, okay. Yeah, that's the golden couple. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, what's your feeling on that one? You but I mean, it's not one. It's not one photograph. It's a whole series of photographs. Yes, but take one photograph. But I'm not this taking one. one photograph of mummy and daddy, right? I'm taking the book as such. It's grimy. It's not even disturbing. It's just grimy. Her tribe. I mean, I don't really understand. Um, I mean, she's got every aspect in this particular book of. Um, grimy photographs i mean you know men showing their bums which is quite ordinary you know women showing their tits which is quite ordinary men showing each other their penises which is ridiculous nonsense well i think everyone's fallen in love so in that way you can relate to it and then maybe what the discussion is is what the limits are of what we can show and you know so that that is where um, often people do have a line that is way before the material in the Ballad of Sexual Dependency, but to have that discussion to where that line is, I think is actually quite useful because sometimes we assume that our own moral boundaries are shared by everyone. Um, and the Ballad of Sexual Dependency pushes on a lot of those moral boundaries and kind of asks us why we have them. Um, and it may be that at the end of the conversation you think, well, I'm still in the same place. <laughs> I still want to put all of those images of nudity, uh, sexuality kind of over there, but at least you've had to examine why you have that boundary. Well, it's very much, it's very much a personal diary as far as I can see. Uh, uh, and she seemed to have, a, have, have had a troubled family life. She, um, uh, I mean, her, her sister um, committed suicide and um, you know, she she I read somewhere. You know, she talked about her parents always being like revisionists, that they that they did, that whatever happened in a family, um, they changed the story 
And part of this, she said anyway, was to try and record the story as, as, as she saw it. And she developed what somebody mentioned was her tribe. Um, which were people, they weren't family, they were, they were friends, and, but they were her, her, her real family. I would say she's from a, a background of privilege. There is no merit at all in any of those photographs, none whatsoever. I, 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 I guess, as, as, as I said, a diary, I mean, whether it, it, it's not, I don't think people look at it as in, in terms of a traditional way of the merits of the photographs, it's, it's the whole thing. Yeah. As I understand, it, it, it started off as, as a slideshow to music. You know, and this is, as she said herself, the book with the film. I, she's not, she's not cozying up to us, you know. No, well, we're not cozying up to her either. <laughs> In The Ballad of Sexual Dependency, Nan Golden wants to photograph the kind of the situation she's in rather than commenting on it from the outside with a particular kind of viewer in mind. So I think part of its power is that she doesn't really seem to care what we think about it. She's quite happy for us to love it or hate it. It's important to her and it's an important expression of her, of her, her life. But more than that, she's not using it to say, look, these people are in trouble, you need to help them. I kind of generally found them all depressing. <laughs> the, this one definitely wasn't my thing. I kind of felt a bit like of some person you don't know or you know who's gone around to various parties and photographed various friends that they've been with or you know occasions that happened but none of them looked that that really that happy and like Eliana said they all look like I really wouldn't want to be there I wouldn't want to have anything to do with any of them and they all look a bit grim I don't know just they did just depressed me I kind of was glad that I wasn't any of them didn't know any of them didn't have anything to do with any of them so I didn't like that one but you le you learn from it you learn what you don't like, in a way. Try not to go down that road. <laughs> Try not to do too much drugs. <laughs> when we read fiction, it's always an unhappy yeah. story. Yeah. It's a life yeah. that you wouldn't want for yourself. Not always. To be an interesting yeah. story, there's always a yeah, problem there or yeah. a, there, has a, there has to be a journey yeah, about absolutely. some grim I mean, stuff, isn't it? Otherwise, it would be we call it shallow, but, wouldn't yeah, we? we call Otherwise. It yeah, that, that's yeah. true. But I think because they don't, because maybe I'm not seeing them as a yeah. story. They don't lead yeah. to anything. They don't resolve. They just show you life as it is in all its different. Mm. I, I I think mm. we are not used to reading this as a story. Yeah. Mm. And then it's superficial. Yeah. Where in oh, a book sure. we go deeper. Nan Golden does, doesn't sure. seem at all apologetic, and she doesn't doesn't no, exactly. doesn't want you to feel that it, she just this is her world. I think it's in the book that mm. it says that some people moved to New York because, because of, of this book yes, because they <laughs> saw that this was so liberating. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. So. yeah, I think it probably would help to see it in relation to some other very well known photo books to see the kind of the newness of what she was doing. Um, so if you put that alongside the book of the Family of Man exhibition, the 1955 exhibition that tried to uh, present all of human experience in this very celebratory way, and which has, I think Nan Golden is replying to that in the way that she has sections on kind of um, uh, sort of love, death, uh, coupling, in the way that the Family of Man would see as a very sort of stable cycle going from birth to death in Nan Golden's book she kind of presents like the sort of flip side of that so sometimes it helps to understand what she's replying to but I guess everyone knows how we use photography to represent ourselves and our family and so that's one way that everyone can respond to the ballad of sexual dependency to think how is this the same or, or different to what I, you know, have as my series of pictures to represent me um, and represent, you know, kind of key moments in my life? And most of the time we don't have pictures of us in distress or when we've been hurt or when we're arguing or drunk. And so she does photograph moments which, you know, don't normally go into a family album or don't go into your Facebook feed. I think I don't mind the fact that it's, um, you know, an aspect of life that we don't see every day or that um, sometimes it's unpleasant to look at or um, because 
that does happen in life and you just you know it's nice that that people can just say well here it is and this is what happens in life sometimes and it's you know you just get on with it and this picture I found really interesting because is that if that's Nan mm -hmm. yeah. and that's Brian I thought well who took the picture I think she's holding something in her hand don't you think isn't she, uh, I don't know. Where you have one of this remote kind of. I thought So it's sort of, I mean, I was thinking, is it staged yeah. or is this something that happens in the relationship often mm -hmm. and then she's just taking a picture of it to like almost catalogue it? Or that picture of him smoking is like mm -hmm. yeah, him it's echo, isn't it? yeah. forward. It's, I mean, you could look at it and just look at it for ages. I did like this one, but I loved this one as well. It was, um, I think, almost from like a historical point of view, it was really interesting. The, the, the contrast between, you know, the two boys in the car, the, the rich and, you know, the not so well off. So I was, I would look at these two over and over again, really. Um, it, these are the first photography books I've ever looked at. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm quite intrigued, wow. you know. Baptism of fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when, you know, I know they're classics and I can see, yeah, I can see how they are classics. And yeah, it was, it was quite enjoyable. Yeah. And I think we're shooting Margaret. I mean, it's a bit of an interest, isn't it? Well, I mean, give it out a ten. We, we have a very simple approach. Yes, uh, uh, so each book. Please. The Americans. Seven, Stephen Shore, five, and Nan Golden, three. Right. Well, I will second that marking. I mean, we just happened to honestly pick the, the, the numbers that I would have been dishing out. So well, I would give that. this a seven. They're not lucky numbers. I would give this a seven. I would give the Americans a four, right? And I would certainly give that a two. Well, I'll ditto that one. When I started, I would have given that nine, but I give this nine. I give this seven. Um, this here, um, eight, because um, I'm. I want to live to see the future, and this is carrying something of the future. There's something in that interesting uh, for the future.